Good morning. It's great to be with you this morning or afternoon or evening or whenever you're watching this uh, since uh, we're recording this and uh, not everyone's uh, able to be here. Uh, just like to say happy Easter and uh, just uh, what a wonderful Resurrection Sunday as uh, we celebrate today uh, an empty tomb and a Savior who has risen. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, this morning, uh, I'd like to read uh, the resurrection story. Um, this is going to be from uh, Luke 24. And uh, the first part we're going to read is going to be uh, verses 1 through 12. And then my sermon is, uh, my, my message is going to kind of be based on the uh, two travelers uh, on the road to Emmaus. And uh, so I want you just to kind of hold your, if you open up your Bibles this morning, just hold your mark there. Um, after we read this first part, because uh, we're going to jump right into verse 13 as we continue uh, going through the, the message this morning. So let's go ahead and start this morning by uh, reading uh, Luke uh, 24, uh, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. And while they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all of the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter, he got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home amazed at what had happened. This morning I'd just like us to have a word of prayer before uh, uh, we jump into the message here and uh, just uh, thank God for, for Resurrection Sunday. Dear Father, we, uh, we just thank you, Lord, for this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday. Lord, as, as we remember uh, this past week, uh, all that your Son has done for us, Lord, as he, he went to the cross for us to, to die for our sins, and uh, Lord, uh, he had defeated death. And today uh, we have a risen Savior uh, and an empty tomb to celebrate, Father. And we just, we thank you for that, Lord. And Lord, this morning I, I just ask that this message go forth and into the hearts of those that are listening and that are hearing it. Uh, and that the Spirit would just speak to each person. That someone would just take something away from this, Lord. That they can praise you and just uh, give you glory for, Lord. And we just thank you. We ask all this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, I want to talk about, uh, starting in verse 13, is the story uh, of these two men uh, that they're, they're on their way to Emmaus. They're, they're leaving Jerusalem, and uh, they're, they're heading away from kind of where all the action is and, and has taken place. And, and we see in this story where Jesus kind of just shows up. Uh, as they're heading back, and uh, I want to, I think we can learn some stuff from this story, and we can kind of see some stuff that, that's taking place, and, and we can apply them to our lives, and, and it can give us great hope, and uh, so this morning, I, I have these three key points that I want to focus on, and so the, the first one I want to share with you this morning is he walks with us, okay, and uh, we see in this story how, how Jesus begins to walk with these men, and uh, Luke twenty four fifteen it says, While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. So, so they were talking about everything that had happened in Jerusalem. Uh, they, were, they were talking about all of the stuff that had taken place that week and, and how Jesus had gone to the cross and, and how he had, had died. And, and, and to them, it, it just wasn't making 100% sense. They, they were kind of almost confused about it. And, and so that's what we see. Now, now there's things that, that, that should have piqued their interest. Uh, 
because they, they did know that the tomb was empty. Because in their, in their story uh, later on here, they, they're telling Jesus how they remember uh, that the women came back that morning and told him about this empty tomb. And, and that these two angels, these two men had told them that, uh, that he was alive. And, and then on top of that, they re recall his words uh, uh, about the third day uh, that he would rise again. And, and so it's not like they're, 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 these things haven't been hidden from them, that they do remember these things. But yet, they don't recommend, or I'm sorry, recognize Jesus. You know, I, I like to think in hindsight that I would have stuck around. You know, putting my, myself in their shoes thinking, uh, I, I, I wouldn't have left Jerusalem. I would have stayed there. But I'm not so sure because many times, you know, we will, will, when something's not going our way, we, we can end up going in a wrong direction. And, and I believe on this day, things just weren't making 100% sense to these men. And so we start to see them going in the wrong direction. They're leaving Jerusalem. Uh, they, they, they didn't even wait for the end of the third day to come. And in our lives, what's awesome about this passage, I believe, is, is that even when we're going in the wrong direction... God will show up. God will, will show up and he will walk with us. And sometimes he will even chase us down. Especially and sometimes when our hearts are not seeking him. Is it always pleasant? No, it is not always pleasant. But uh, yes, God will show up. And that is the true heart of God. The love that he has for us. Romans in chapter 5, it says that, that even while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. He chased us down. He wanted a reconciled relationship with us. But many times, we don't see this. We don't recognize Jesus, especially when we're going in the wrong direction. So, they didn't recognize him. Verse 16, it says, But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Now remember, the beginning of this in verse, uh, I think, 13 or 14, it says that, they, that Emmaus was seven miles from Jerusalem. And so they're, they're walking with Jesus for seven miles. And, and, and they're, they're telling Jesus all about Jesus. And that is just it amazes me. But yet, they don't recognize him. And there's a second time earlier in that week that records of a city that doesn't recognize Jesus. And uh, it is Jerusalem. And it is on Jesus' triumphal entry that uh, as he's coming into the city, he's coming over, you know, this, this, the hill on the Mount of Olives, and he sees the city. And it says in verse 41 of Luke 19, it says, He came near the city and, and saw the city, and he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Do we always recognize Jesus? You would have thought that a people who knew God's word inside and out, the Pharisees, the scribes, the leaders of Israel, they knew they were waiting on a Messiah and they were expecting deliverance. You would have thought they would have recognized their God in the day that he was here with them. But they didn't. Why? Well, their problem was they were looking at their problem. Rome was their problem. That was what they were focused on. They wanted a Messiah to deliver them from this oppression of Rome. Instead, God wanted them to see the relationship with him. The sin in, in, in our lives was a barrier between us and God and, and it, in their day that, that's what they didn't see that that was a bigger problem than Rome and God was coming to bring them out of the slavery of sin so that they could have a relationship with him let's take for instance in our lives currently this uh, virus, this pandemic that, that we're in um, so many things happen so many people affected by this and that is the problem in our lives right now it's what can take our focus and, and overwhelm us. 
And in that, it can take our focus off of God. So, in all of this, where do you see Jesus? Because as we look back at Jerusalem, Jesus was there. Jesus was with his people, but they didn't recognize him. Do we see Jesus today? Do you see God working amongst all of our problems, amongst everything that's going on in our lives? Probably, actually, one of the best questions we can ask ourselves is do people see Jesus in us right now? During all that is happening in this world, do they see Jesus in us? His love, his mercy, his kindness, his compassion, all of those attributes that he has. Are people seeing that in us? So the first point I had was Jesus walks with us. And second point I want to pull out today, he reveals himself to us. Now, Jesus wants to show us his heart. Jesus wants us to be just like him. God wants us to be like his son. And he wants to reveal himself to us. But we have a problem. He has to give us a heart change first. Listen to Ezekiel 36, 26. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove from you, from your body, the heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. God will change our hearts, and he will give us his spirit. For these two men... Jesus had to begin that heart change on the road to Emmaus. And that means they first must recognize their heart condition. So Jesus starts off with, these, with, with kind of two questions. Um, so that it gets them to kind of share their disappointment, their true heart of how they felt. And he's, here's his first question. He says, what are you discussing with each other while you're walking along? And they answer, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? And he asked them, what things? Well, did, did Jesus not know? Did, did, was, he, <laughs> did, was he not aware? No, no. He, he was probing their hearts so that they kind of had a heart check to realize that they, they were struggling with believing and that they had started to lose hope. In verse, verse 17 it says, they stood still looking sad. So when Jesus comes up and he starts to ask these questions, they're, they're downcast. They're, they're sad about what took place because it, it didn't live up to their expectations of what they thought. But in verse 21, they kind of uh, have this heart check as they're, they're telling Jesus all of these things. And they, says, they say this, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. They had lost hope. They, it wasn't something that they still had. It was gone. They had hope. He's now dead. They thought that, that he was the one to redeem Israel. And so why? Why did they lose that hope? Well, they didn't recognize Jesus, that he had come to redeem mankind from the slavery of sin. Instead, they thought he came to conquer Rome. And when that didn't happen, they lost hope. They did not see what Jesus was doing. So when we lose hope, what do we always do? We tend to want to have things go back to the way we think they should, should be or go back to what we know, um, especially when we've lost hope in situations. You know, in, in everything that's going on right now, we want things to go back to normal in our lives because we're focusing on the problem. Um, in whatever trial we're in, that is just a natural thing to want to go back. And so I believe that's what we see in these men's lives where they have lost hope and they're going back to what they know. They're going back to a mass. So on the, uh, now Jesus, again, he, he has to change their heart condition. He's probed their heart a little bit. And, and so here's what, here's what he's going to do now. He's going to point it out to them. He says, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Okay? How slow of heart to believe. So you know these things, these men. You know these things, but you're slow of heart to believe them. You, you're not fully understanding. You don't 
really quite grasp what's going on. And so Jesus begins to reveal himself through his word. And he asks them this question. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? They were looking for a Messiah to come and set up a kingdom and, and, and rule and reign in a physical earthly kingdom and rid them of Rome at that time. That was their problem. Okay? And so when Jesus says this question to them, it kind of start, has to startle them a bit. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer? Should suffer? That doesn't make sense to them. And so he's beginning now to make them aware. He's beginning to reveal what he had, has came to do. And, uh, you know, they, they are a little bit blind to the scriptures. And so in verse 27, uh, here's, what, here's what it says. Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all of the scriptures. So Jesus has to take what they've already heard and he has to interpret them. And it's, it's, they know the scriptures, but he has to show them himself in them. God, he, 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 we will find him every single time we seek him in his word. He will reveal himself to us. God is not trying to, hard, or trying to hide from us. He, he wants us to seek him with all of our heart. And when we do that, we will find him. Jeremiah 29, 13 says this. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all of your heart. Are we seeking God with all of our heart today? So my first two points. He walks with us, and, and that's a time in which we get to know him. My second point, he reveals himself to us. And during that, that reveal... Uh, is the time that we begin to to grow, to learn about God, to love God, and then we begin to become like Him. Okay, during during this process of this revealing, uh, as it happens, and and we see that in these men's lives, because uh, as they're as they're reaching Emmaus uh, and they get there, um, and Jesus is just pretty much told, talked and talked to them for a long time now. It, you know, just to kind of give you an idea, seven miles uh, in, in an average day in, in that terrain over there, in that day, a person would travel 15 to 18 miles, okay? So this is almost a half a day's journey uh, for them to get to Emmaus. And so they had lots of time to talk to Jesus. And when they, when they reach, it, reach, reach Emmaus, they have this... this uh, they, they don't want him to continue on because Jesus acts like he's going to keep going. And they say, hey, hey Jesus, uh, come back here. You know, come stay with us. It's already late, um, you know, in the day. It's late in the evening. Uh, come, and, come and stay with us here. And, and uh, so this is going to be my third point, that he gave himself for us. And uh, so, so Jesus has piqued these men's interest um, and... Uh, they now want to kind of know a little more. They, 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 they have this interest about everything he's told them about. And they come in and they're at the table together in, in these two men, in this men's homes in Emmaus. And uh, Jesus breaks bread with them. And uh, verse 30, it says, When they were at the table with him, he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Now, in this story, this bread, this is an image of Jesus' body. You know, as he breaks this bread at this table, he, he's, he's showing this image that his body had to be broken for them. Okay? And in, in John 6, 50 and 51, it says this, This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that, come, that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So Jesus is declaring that he is giving his body to be broken for us. Okay, And, and he, he breaks this and he offers it to them. He gives it to them. And, and they partake of him. They partake of this bread and their eyes are opened. He is revealed to them. Okay? Well, 
Jesus, if you don't know Jesus today as your Lord and Savior, and you're unsure, Jesus is offering this free gift to you of eternal life. It's, he, he's done all of the work. His body has been broken for you. He has defeated death. He's risen from the grave. And he's done it all for you with his blood. So if you don't know Jesus today, make him the Lord and Savior of your life. And you, you say, well, how? How do I do that? You repent of your sins. And you ask God for forgiveness. And you believe that he died for you on the cross. That, that penalty that he paid on the cross was for your sin. And he has defeated death and he's risen from the grave and he's given you eternal life. It's that simple. It's that simple. John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He gave. He offered him for us so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. It's all because of what he has done. These two men believed after partaking in Jesus. Remember, they had witnessed everything that had happened in Jerusalem. They recounted all of the stories of Jesus to Jesus on the road to Emmaus. So, so it's very fresh with them, all of these things. But yet they were feeling hopeless they were sad because things didn't go the way they thought they should have. But when Jesus reveals himself to them and they partook of him, it's they now believe and it changed everything. Everything for them. For anyone who is a believer in Jesus, this next part of these two men's story should excite us. It should be, we should be over ecstatic with, with, with what happened next. Verse 33 says this, and for 33 and 34, I'm going to read. That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. That same hour. That same hour. The hour their eyes were opened, the hour that they seen Jesus, their risen Lord and Savior, at that moment, they believed. And there was haste in their, in their, their lives. They, they didn't wait. Remember, it was evening. It was, it was late in the day. It's the reason they invite, told, told Jesus to come in and stay. And they, they didn't wait. They got up that hour and they ran back to Jerusalem. Why? Because their beliefs had, their, their belief had changed their view. They no longer focused on their problem, but rather they were focused on Jesus. And they needed to tell somebody that he was alive and that they had seen him. And he had revealed himself through scripture to them. And I can only imagine picturing these two men running back to Jerusalem uh, to go back and tell everyone of what they seen, to tell the other disciples uh, that, that they had seen this ri their risen Savior. Uh, what excitement and joy that had to be inside of them at that moment, um, the, the haste that they had. Are we like these two men? Are we hastened to tell people about our risen Savior? Well, as I close today, Listen to some of Jesus' final words to his disciples just before his ascension. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Three things that I'll leave you with today. God is in control, and he has all authority in heaven and on earth, no matter whatever our problems might be. God is in control, and he has all authority. Second point, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, we are to go and make disciples. The joy that he fills you 
which should cause you to run to Jerusalem just like it did for these men. You should want to tell the world about a risen Savior. And finally today, your risen Savior is always with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is always with you. Thank you guys very much. I'd like to close us in prayer and uh, we'll be finished. Father, I just uh, come to you this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday. Father, and I just thank you so much for your son that you were willing to, to give him for us, Lord. And uh, that he was willing to go to a cross for us. To, to take our sin upon him and uh, hang on that cross and be sacrificed for us, Lord. Father, I just, I thank you for his heart. I thank you that your love is, is that great. But Father, today, I praise you, God. I praise you and I thank you for the empty tomb and the risen Savior, God. What an amazing story that because of all of that, we can have everlasting life with you, Lord. And I just thank you today. Father, I just ask that uh, everyone that's listening, that's, that's heard this message, that, that Lord, that you would just pour out your blessing upon them on um, this day and, and that you would be with them, Lord, as they celebrate a risen Savior. And just ask all that in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.